and we said about faith, which is, uh, we all preach about so much, but have, I think, so little. <laughs> and I'm quite sure, like the brother said the other night, that the, the only way really to exercise faith is to get, as, as a lady came to me one day, let me put it this way, and she said, you know, I enjoyed the talk about faith. And she said, I really, really would like to exercise faith. And I said, well, this is wonderful. And she says, but uh, how, how do you really exercise it? I said, well, I know one way. I don't think it's the most popular, but there's one way when you can really exercise faith. He said, well, all right, let me just, just let me write this down. I said, you won't need to write it down. I said, because this is the, this is the secret, I think. You have to get into such a jam that you can't get out any other way but by faith. Oh, I'll think about it, she said. <clears throat> I'm sure she wasn't too worried, really, about learning how to exercise faith. But you know, God very often cuts all the props away until we've nothing to lean on and no one to lean on. And as I say very often to myself, if I have God, I don't need anybody else. If I don't need God, I need every prop I can get to lean on. But if I have God, he's my all-sufficiency. There's no inadequacy in him. Often when talking about John 15, a very wonderful chapter, as you know. I often say to people, before ever you read John 15, <coughs> you should read Ezekiel 15. Because in Ezekiel 15, you have a description of the vine which tells us that it's no good for anything at all. You don't make furniture out of the vine. You don't. The vine is there for one thing only, and that is to produce fruit. And, and, and out of fruit, of course, you get the wine. Now, by the same token, I think if you're going to study Abraham, you can't skip the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans because it's almost entirely about Abraham. And I think that in that fourth chapter of Romans you have one of the very best, if you want to call it, a definition of faith. In Romans 4 and verse 20 it says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he promised he was able to perform. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if you really get that and digest it, masculate it, it, it gets, as I say so often, truth is no good up here. You've got to get it in your bloodstream. Amen. And if you really can get hold of that with both hands of faith, as it were, and say, well, I'm fully persuaded that what God has promised, he is able to perform. And you know Abraham in this situation was up against the jam because two verses previously, it says, remember, he was a hundred years of age and his wife was about eighty. And God had promised them that they should have a child. Well, as I said yesterday, it must have been a bit disturbing, maybe, to, for her to go to her mother. You see, we read the story as though they weren't human, as though they're kind of cardboard figures. There's Abraham and there's Sarah, and they weren't like me. They never had emotions. They never felt any shadow of doubt. They were never disturbed. Sure, they were human beings. And when the Lord began to work and challenge them, as I said, it may be sound almost facetious that she would say to her mother-in-law, to her mother, well, uh, uh, well, mother, we're going. Well, where are you going? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, how far is it? Well, I don't know. Well, how long will it really take you to get there? Don't know. Well, what kind of a country is it? Don't know. Who lives there? Don't know. Well, that doesn't sound too positive, does it? I mean, it's, it's hardly positive thinking. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Peel, but there you are. It, it, it seems so negative, negative. No, 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 no. It was a challenge of faith. But then when later Abraham comes up and he says, you know, darling, we're going to have a child. Oh, my mother will enjoy me writing home and telling her I'm going to have a baby and I'm 80 years of age. This is really something, isn't it? Now, are you sure you got this straight? And he is a hundred years of age. But you know, I, I think, now you can put it in other language, but I believe God had to back off from Abraham because he couldn't win with him. That even when it came to the place where he, he was willing to slay his son, Abraham says, so what? What's the problem? No problem in me killing my son because God will raise him up again. And like, oh boy, I can't win with this fellow. Because if I kill him, I've got to raise him up anyhow. He said, if, if I destroy my boy, he's able and willing to raise him up again. So the Lord says, well, you passed the test anyhow, you're willing to give him. 
<clears throat> and I'm able to raise him up again if needs be. Again, coming to this tremendous situation, again, we read it so easy, it doesn't mean too much to us. But you know, sometimes that thing that looks like a mountain to you, to Abraham, would have looked like a molehill. You'd say, oh, what are you sweating and worrying about? There's nothing in there. The God that I trust, why? I'm fully persuaded that he is able to do all that he has promised. I have a phrase in one of my books, and folk have written to me about it and said it's blessed them and hurt them and all the rest of it. And, and it's the phrase where I happen to say that I think that we, as a generation of Christians, we're unbelieving believers. And then about three weeks ago, I picked up Marie Monson's book. Her, uh, she participated in the Shangtung Revival. And I was reading through this very rapidly for a certain reason, and she said, I came to the conclusion that that we are unbelieving believers. So in the mouth of two witnesses, it's established anyhow. And I think that one of the most embarrassing things when you and I get to the judgment seat, and really that's going to be something, isn't it? Hmm? When the whole game is finished, when the Lord isn't going to measure how high your church steeple is from the ground, or how big your Sunday school crowd was, I think, when you and I stand naked and bare, I can't lean on my darling wife, she can't lean on me, you on someone else, now, I do agree, of course, I believe that when the two become, become one flesh, there's going to be some sharing in this. Because the Word of God says that those who stayed at home got the same reward as those that went to battle. But you know, when we stand at the judgment seat, I think one of the most embarrassing things will be for the Lord to say, look at all these exceeding great and precious promises, and most of you never even inherited one of them. I don't know if you've been to Scotland, but Scotland, like other countries, the capital cities there, Glasgow particularly, has big areas of slums. I think it's called the Gobels there. It's an accepted fact, as ridiculous as it may sound, that in Scotland there are multiplied millions, if not billions, of unclaimed dollars. Because people are never bothered to trace their ancestry. Somebody left somebody a million dollars, it's been accumulating, compounding the interest, it's getting bigger and bigger, and there are people living in slum property with rats and cockroaches and all the other rotten things around who should be living up the country in, a, in one of those castles. And having 5,000 or 10,000 acres of land and all the shooting and fishing rights and servants, but they never bothered to sort the thing out. They never bothered to... Uh, to trace and see if, if really I do inherit these things. You see. Now you can't inherit things because you're a child. Paul makes that very, very clear in his word. If a boy goes along and says, well, I'm ten years of age, my father's John Smith, I've got photographs, here's the doctor who brought me into the world, here's my Aunt Mary, she identifies me, and I've got everything I need, and now I've come for my daddy's ten million dollars. And they say, no, sir, because there's a clause in this will that says you're not to inherit this money until you come to maturity. Now, because you're a child, you can't inherit. Paul makes that very clear. In Romans, I forget the chapter there for the moment. But he says you must come to maturity and then we can inherit. You know why the world is so stricken outside? Because the church on the inside has failed to inherit. We haven't claimed our rights in Jesus Christ. To most people, Christianity is escaping hellfire and a husband that doesn't spit on the rug and doesn't beat you up and doesn't get drunk and he's a nice guy. And we're all sweet because our pastor says we're sweet. We pay our tithes and uh, we, as a matter of fact, we gave him a colored TV. I remember one hour I went into where the preacher preached a lot against TV and then at Christmas the people in church didn't know what to do so they bought him a colored TV and he took it and that solved the problem. <clears throat> See, the pastor has one now, so he can't say all about our TV, and then that's all right, he took it. But some of the promises in the Word of God, they shake me to my toes. I can't get over that word where it says we're heirs of God. Now, now that takes my breath away. But after it says we're heirs of God, it says we're joint heirs, and we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And Jesus said that he had everything that he asked of the Father. Now, why are we living in poverty? As I said the other day, there's nothing God can do for the world I live in. He, he can't give us another Bible, it's complete. He can't give us another Calvary. Jesus finished everything, including destroying the power of the devil. He can't give us another Holy Spirit. God has done everything he can do. It depends on our appropriation. Sure, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but as my good friend Duncan Campbell often says, not independent of human personality. 
God takes human personality and weds it to his will and then he performs. And so here we are, we're faced with these, what the Bible doesn't call promises, it doesn't even call them great promises, it calls them exceeding great and precious promises. And if I can get Hebrews 11, and I've done this, now I'm not ashamed to tell you this, I remember at Teen Challenge, come into a series of challenges there, and I would say to my secretary, I, I'm, I'm going out and I, uh, I may not be back today. But if you do need me, ring across to the house, I'll, I'll be in my room. And I would just go lay on my bed. Tozer used to say, there's only one way to pray, only one way to seek God, and that's face downward. There's a scripture that says that if you search for it. And I don't like to lay on the cold floor, it's not good anyhow, but I always, I always lay flat when I pray, I lay across the bed. And I have laid on the bed after I've opened to Hebrews 11, 6 and stuck my finger on it and defied the world and the flesh and the devil and I've said, God is, and he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. But before that it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now as I said yesterday, faith is not a magic carpet. And faith is not a wishing well. <clears throat> it is not right to say that faith can do anything. Faith cannot do anything. <clears throat> and I quote it again, if you weren't here, that if, 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 if a bunch of us pledge ourselves to live the next week just in, in fasting and prayer, shut up in a room, spending day and night in intercession, and fasting and believing for the conversion of the devil, he still won't be saved however much faith we have. There are certain things that God says will not happen. By the same token, if you go pray around the grave of John Wesley, we could do with him right now, and we certainly need Luther to come along and shake the Church of Rome for a change, but uh, what, what are you going to do? Go around his grave and believe for him to be raised up? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. We were in a church not long ago, and the pastor in this very fine church, got plenty of money, that's a very fine congregation. I preached that often. And one Sunday morning, he stood up and announced that he was going to leave. And it, it, it scared the people. And some people came to me afterwards and said, Well, what do you think? What are we going to do? Won't the church fall apart? Well, if it can, it should. If it's built around the pastor, then it should fall apart. If it's built around Jesus Christ, it won't fall apart. Well, what do you think of it? Well, I said, I can only say one thing that comes to my mind now, that when God buries Moses, he raises up Joshua. This is the divine order. That God, I'm sure, in these days is looking for men and women of faith. I had the privilege more than once of preaching in the Bible School of Wales. Some of you must have, how many of you had Reese Howell's Intercessor? You read that? Well, you should read it. One of the greatest books of our generation, written by a fellow I've known for about 40 years, Norman Grubb. And after speaking in the college to the students and staff, Little Mrs. Howe says, Brother Raynell, come here, please. And we walked up this great staircase. It, you could drive an automobile up it. It's very wide. And we went up and turned left and turned right. And then we stood on the veranda of this great old mansion used to be owned by a lord or a millionaire or somebody. And as we looked down, there was a great block of granite, I suppose maybe eight, or nine, ten feet long. There used to be an equestrian statue on it. That is a statue of a man on a horse. Now, I don't know whether they did like the scripture says, the horse and his rider they cast into the sea, but anyhow, they pulled the thing off and thrown it away. And they chiseled deep into the block of stone there, Jehovah Jireh. Now, it's exciting to talk about faith. It's more exciting to exercise it. But it's pretty scary sometimes when you think of what men dare to do. And yet, in one sense, there's no sweat and no anxiety about it. I said very often, and I say it over and over again to myself, there are three things that faith does. First of all, it reckons on God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith reckons on the faithfulness of God. God said it, I'll do it. I saw him the other day about some insurance for driving this automobile. And uh, they said, we'll send it, but you're covered from this very moment. Now, I have nothing to prove that I'm covered. I haven't a piece of paper, I haven't anything. But I take the word of a girl in an office up in Ohio that at that moment she covered that automobile and I'm reckoning on the faithfulness of that group. Now, the first thing that faith does, it reckons that God is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
And then what does faith do? Faith rests. Or if you like to put the second thing is that first of all it reckons and it risks. It ventures out on God. So you reckon, then you risk, and then you rest. Now, why did Mrs. Reese Howells take me upstairs? She said, Brother Ray, isn't this a lovely place? And I said, it's a marvelous estate. And the little Welsh woman smiled and she said, you know, Brother Ravenhill, many people in the world, hundreds of thousands of people have read books by Norman Grubb, and they know, she said, that Daddy, meaning her husband, that Daddy bought this estate with a shilling in his pocket, a shilling being about 40, 12 cents at that time. And he went down to an office in town and he said he would buy this estate, which I don't know what it cost, something like, say, $100,000. Now, when he went in the office, they told him he couldn't have it because he said, that man going out has just bought this place for the Roman Catholic Church and you can't have it. Now, we've got some other, we've got another estate up there called Skitty Fowl, you can have that. He said, the Lord told me I was going to have Derwen Fowl. That's the Welsh name for it. And the lawyer said, now, you, you can't have Derwen Fowl. Now, look there, you, you see, you see, it's signed already, the document's signed. And you can't have it. And here's the check, see, there's the check. Didn't draw yet. That man put a down payment on this estate. You can't have it. Now I've got some other pictures around here. Look, I can show you a lot of. You see, I've got estates like this. Now, now, what place would you like? And he said Derwentville. I just told you you can't have Derwentville, the Roman Catholic. Look, look. If, if you're not, if you don't agree with what I say, he said here. Look, this is the, this is, these are the conditions of the estate. Now you take it and read it. And he pointed it to the office girl. You know. One of those nuts from religious focus. So he sits there reading it and he says, Well, praise the Lord. The kind of stuff in an office is bad enough in church, but in an office. He said, uh, Say, Mr. Lawyer, did you read this? I read it through a dozen times. Would you just read that, the, that little thing there? Yeah, I'll read it. And under no conditions whatever must this estate ever pass into the Roman Catholic Church. Well, that's funny. I've read that half a dozen times. I never saw that before. Well, now he said, is your document valid? He said, no, it isn't. Are well, you going to buy it? You see, before he went, he got a promise from God from a strange, obscure part of the Word of God that God would give him so many wedges of gold. And all he did was find out how much a wedge of gold weighed and then the current value of gold, and he worked it all out. And he says, thank you, Lord. Now, now, the Word of God tells us, you know, you're not to strain your faith. You're only to go and, uh, going to the measure of your faith. All men do not have faith. You hear somebody say over the radio, now every man has faith. <clears throat> Don't worry about that. You get in an airplane and sit down and he goes north and you know you're going south. And he goes north and you don't ask any questions. You don't say, hey, pilot, just a minute, just a minute. You, you, you just show me your, your certificate. You may be a garbage man in that uniform. I don't know whether you're a pilot. Now show me a pilot's license. Now that's all right. Now, now show me the license for the plane. That's all right. Now just a minute. I noticed the man out on the wing there and he was talking. I'm not sure he filled up with gas. You just let me walk out on the wing and take the cap off and dip in the tank and then I want to go to the other. Oh, wouldn't that be a wonderful performance if everybody did? You sit in a plane. As far as you're concerned, it's okay. As far as the pilot knows, there might be something wrong with it, or he fears there might be. One great fellow in the air industry once told me, he said, if you knew how little your life was hanging on, you'd never get in a place anyhow. Well, I don't like them. Flying's for the birds as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> but anyhow, you don't check up like you sit in a plane. But that's natural faith in a natural man. It's got nothing to do with spiritual faith. Because the Apostle Paul says in the second letter to the, uh, uh, to the Thessalonians, all men have not faith. Faith is the gift of God upon my repentance. And once I have faith, and I can exercise my faith, less than you exercise yours. We don't all have the same measure of faith. This man had a measure of faith. He got a promise from God. He says to the man, I'll buy the estate. All right. He goes home and he's, boy, I'm going to have a time of praise now. And he got down there and started praising the Lord. And do you know what happened? As soon as he started praising the Lord, the Lord said, shut up. Did you ever hear the Lord say that? Maybe you didn't think he talked English like that, eh? 
Did the Lord ever tell you to shut up? In other words, he says, I can't get a word in edgeways. Why don't you shut up and listen to me? It's more important than you listen to me than I listen to you anyhow. So he shut up. And he said, now, Lord, what's wrong? He said, what are you going to pay for Derwen Vowers? Oh, he said, I promised, um, yeah, I promised I'd pay, for argument's sake, $120,000. Fine. How much did I promise you? 100000 That's all right. The Lord said, I'll pay my 100000 you pay your 20000 I don't have 20000 cents. $20,000 is nothing to you. Look out on a thousand years. Sure, they're mine, but they're not yours. All that I'm giving you out of my resources is $100,000. That's all. That's all I promise. That's all I'm giving you. Now, you find that... Oh, I can't do that. Well, go back and tell the man in the, in the office that uh, you can't do it. He'll think I'm a fool. Oh, he said, don't worry. He thinks that already. You don't need to bother about that. All you have to do, go back and tell him that you can't. So he went back and told his story, and the man says, what do you mean? He said, well, God won't give me the money. Well, why did you sign it? Well, he promised to give me 100,000, but I can't get the other 20. Now, he got an assurance from God that he tried to step over what God had promised him. And God says, no, I'm not here for you to pull strings on me. You can't commit me to 20,000 cents, never mind $20,000. Well, 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 would you write to the owner of the building and, and, and uh, see if he'll do something? Because I want this for a Bible school, and right now they have 350 children there. I think Jimmy Stewart sent his children there at one time. They have 350 students, and every one of those children and students there are the children of missionaries. Nobody else can get in the school. He wouldn't take my children. I tried to get them in once. He said, you're not a missionary. <laughs> and here I am trying to get all the heathen in America saved. I'm not a missionary. But anyhow, he wouldn't take my children either. <clears throat> well, Lord, what will I do? He said, write and tell the man, Lord so-and-so, who owns the building, will you? And he wrote to Lord so-and-so. Now, he was going 20,000 over what God had promised him. But when he humbled himself and saw the face of God and obeyed God, this Lord so-and-so, who had expected about $175,000 for the place, and was chagrined that even the Roman Catholic Church were going to get it for 150. Now, he was going to get it 30,000 less than the Roman Catholic Church, and he was getting a kick out of that. But he just couldn't put pressure on God for the last $20,000. So when they wrote to this Lord so-and-so and told him what was happening, he wrote back and said, in the circumstances, I'd be very happy to let the estate go for $80,000. And instead of being 20000 in the hole, he was 20000 in pocket. Why? Because he obeyed God and he humbled himself. You know, it's amazing what we... What, what, you, you can't tell what God's going to do if you really obey him. A brother came to me last night. He's not here this morning, I guess. And he said, Brother Ray, no, you were here last May. We had the meetings in the other building there. One night we had a great break. And you remember, a lot of men sought God. And they wept and they prayed. And he said, it took me three or four hours, if I remember his words. It took me three or four hours to get really cleaned out with God. But God met me and changed my life. Not only that. I think he, I'm right in quoting his figure. He said, we've been married for 16 years and my wife has had her epileptic fits regularly. And as soon as I got right with God and prayed, God healed her and she hasn't had a, a fit this year. Since I knelt over there in the concrete or somewhere in one of these buildings and I got straightened out with God and God immediately began to work in my family. Why? Because he obeyed God, that's why. You can go beyond what God wants you to go, and, and, and Satan will harass you if you don't watch out. And he'll tell you that God is unfaithful. God is unfaithful. You were unwise in the thing that you did. He didn't want you to go to $120,000. Now, faith will reckon on God, faith will risk on God, and then faith will rest on God. My, this, this epistle is a fantastic. It talks about a, a, a rest for the people of God, but lots of God's people are so restless, aren't they? You know, we preach on parts of text. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And boy, we go after the sinner on that. Hey, but wait a minute, cross the bridge to the other half of the text. Take my yoke upon you. Oh, I thought you got rid of your bondage. Sure you do. That bondage to this bondage. My freedom, Madam Guillaume said, my freedom is thy grand control. 
When I'm free, then I make a mess of things. When I'm in bondage to the will of God, a delightful bondage, my freedom is thy grand control. Here's a, here's a train going down a railroad track. I remember asking a man on one train, we were crossing the continent, I said, what is this train doing now? He said, this is the straightest piece of the track, and we're touching about 90 miles an hour. I said, I hope you keep on the track. Now, there's a train with all its energy and all its might, but that train is only safe when it runs on the track they've laid down for it. And I don't care how much energy you have, how many baptisms of the Spirit you have, how many gifts of the Spirit, you're only safe when you run down the track that God has laid for you. And that's inside of his word. You know, heresy is truth you push too far. I believe in sanctification. I believe in entire sanctification. I don't believe in sinless perfection. My wife and I went to a conference two years ago, and they, it was a wonderful place. And we said to the lady who runs the place, you get a lot of wonderful people here. And she said, we certainly do, and we get some strange ones. She said, we had a bunch just a few weeks ago that came in, the loveliest kind of people you could meet. They were marvelous. Oh, how they pray, how they sang, how, how the gifts of the Spirit operated. And, and, and when they'd gone through one meeting, I thought, well, this is going to be the greatest thing that we've ever had around here. And then she said afterwards to the leader, you know, I just discovered one thing that you didn't know that everybody who's done all the years I've had a conference here. You didn't open the Bible in your service. Oh, no. We, we gave the Bible up two or three years ago. We believe in direct revelation now. You see, when that which is perfect is come, that which is... And the Bible is only part revelation, and we've given up that, and we have direct revelation. I don't believe it for a moment. Because the Word of God says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall never pass away. Before long, they'll, they'll skid right down. They'll be in a mess before too long, because the Word is a lamp to our feet. The Word is a light to our path. The Word is a rod of correction. The Word is the source of inspiration. And you can't be smarter than God. God has revealed himself by his Son, and he's revealed himself through his Word, and he reveals the Word through the Holy Spirit who inspired the Word. Now, we're not going to deal here again with Abraham. We mentioned a little about him yesterday, and then we mentioned again about Noah. And you remember that we said that Abraham on one level is justified by faith, but it says, according to James, that's what Paul says, he's justified by faith, but uh, uh, James said that, uh, that, um, that um, Abraham was justified by works. He was justified by works when he offered his son and was willing that God should take that son, but he was justified by works in the evidence he could give to the world outside. Now, if we're, if we're right vertically, we should be right horizontally. If we're justified by faith before God, there should be works real works of the Spirit through us that justify the faith that we have in works and in the fruits of the Spirit. Otherwise, all we do is stand up and I say, the kids now, they're bored to death. For the simple reason all you and I try to do is somehow safeguard God's reputation and preach about a man who died 2,000 years ago and think we're almost sprouting wings because we believe in the virgin birth and the physical resurrection. And I remind you very respectfully, the devil believes in them all, but he isn't a Christian. The world is not waiting for a new definition of Christianity, it's waiting for a new demonstration of Christianity. And I say again, if you're an honest interpreter of the Word of God, you've got to come to Hebrews 2 and get down to verse 4 as well as verse 3 on how shall we escape. If we neglect, how shall we escape? The reason that we're, we're in the mess that we're in, we're trying to escape the responsibility of preaching a full old gospel. Because in verse 4 there it says, God bearing them witness with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now who are you to despise God or his gifts? You give me one scripture where you can outlaw gifts of the Spirit or fruits of the... Can you give me one? I say again, I, I, I get chills when I go to some conferences, somebody goes, oh, well, brother, glory to God, I thank God I believe on this old book from cover to cover. And in the next ten minutes he spends explaining why the gifts are not for today and why revival isn't for today and why... And, and the young congregation sang just to give him a bit of a pet before he stood up. They sang, got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. And then he spends time telling you why it can't happen. Now what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says, and this is a terrible thing, 
that if you and I take anything out of the Word of God, He'll take our, our place, our names out of the Book of Life. You say, Brother Raven, I would never take a pair of scissors and cut anything out of the Word of God. Well, preach, I want to tell you something. For the last three years, you've been taking it out because you never preached it, and it's the same thing. If you shut up on it, if you try and find some fancy interpretation, if you run to some book because this brother talks, it doesn't make it right because anybody preaches it. You've got to test it by the Word of God. And I'm absolutely convinced that many reasons for the bankruptcy in our churches these days is that we do not follow through on the, on the things of the Spirit of God. They're not just gifts of the Spirit, they're gifts of the Lord Jesus. Because when he rose again, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, I'm not going lopsided on those things, but I'm wanting to see again a full old gospel. That everything Jesus died for should be manifested in his church today. And when such things happen, you don't have any dead meetings. You don't have any problems with money. You don't have any problems at all if we follow what God says in his holy word. You believe that God is, he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. You believe that these promises are all underlined by an infallible, holy, eternal God. All right, let's skip over. We've said a few things about Abraham. Then we come to Noah. That's a very, very interesting story. But this morning I thought we'd look at another character here. In verse 23 of Hebrews 11, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, I know what some people will say if you say that you're not responsible to the state. First of all, they, they will thumb back into Romans and say, Now you've got to be in subjection, only up to a certain point. See, it's very easy to raise your hat to heroes of faith, isn't it? It's something else to be in their situation. Supposing Daniel had subjected himself to the laws of the state, what would have happened? There'd have been no Daniel, there'd have been no lion's den, there'd have been no deliverance. Supposing the three Hebrew children had said, well, we can't help it, you know, we love the Lord, but the state says you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't... What would have happened? The command had gone forth that any child that was born should be handed over to the, uh, to the uh, powers that be, Pharaoh and his company, and your precious child that you travelled over and you loved, that child must go to the state and be destroyed. And the father and mother said, nothing doing. We're going to hide this child. And you know what it says? It says, by faith he was hid. They had faith in the faithfulness of God. Do you ever read the Bible and it explodes in your face? Or do you just sit down and grind over it and say, Oh boy, Harry Ironside hasn't got much on this, or Schofield either. Boy, this is a tough scripture. I better leave it on one side. Huh? Or do you read it and suddenly, as one man says, it kind of leaps out of the book and takes hold of you by the throat and shakes you and says, Look at this, brother. Look at this. Look at this. Amen. Some years ago, I'd been he reading Hebrews 11, and I closed my Bible and kind of relaxed. And it was just as though the Lord said, Son... Not a single person in Hebrews 11 ever had a Bible. Did you ever think of that? Look at all they did and they never had a Bible. You have a Bible this morning. I have a Bible. It's not a book, it's a library. It's the finished work of God in this, in this area. These people did all these amazing things what did they do? Well, they subdued kingdoms. We haven't got as far as that with communism or Romanism yet, have we? They wrote righteousness. They stopped the mouths of lions. Some women got together and prayed. And what does it say? Right, they prayed, and, and the husbands of the sons were raised from the dead. Oh, come on now, come on now, let's be honest about this. I know you feel very happy about your, your marvelous faith and your knowledge of God, but brother, what's it doing? Who cares if you can recite the Bible from generation, ge Genesis to Revelation? You've got it all up there. Who cares if it's not working out? 
Tell me this, why isn't your son a Christian? What's wrong in your home that they don't want your Christianity? Come on, face up to it. What right have you to preach to other unsaved kids if your kids are not saved? You should resign your church and tell the family, look, your daddy's going to sweep the streets and humiliate you if needs be to you. My family tells the line and you become children of God by faith in Jesus if it takes six months or six years to do it. Have you got faith like that? By faith they subdued kingdoms, not with weapons, not with atom bombs. By faith they subdued kingdoms, they stopped the mouths of lions. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others had courage to stand there and they slayed to death. Brother, that would take some faith, wouldn't it? Knowing that they would receive a better resurrection. Now you chew that over, will you, when you go home one day? Just sit back, read Hebrews 11, and then relax and say, Lord, these people couldn't run when they were in trouble and say, Oh, you know, this morning I was so upset and distressed about something in the family or the church, but I went back to that precious promise again, and I read it for the 119th millionth time, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. They couldn't turn to Romans 8, 28. If they knew the word of God, it was because they'd seen it there in the temple and they'd heard it read and they had to memorize it because every portion of scripture was written by hand and nobody hardly could afford it. Or the Ethiopian unit did, but then he was a wealthy man. And if you want to find a classic case of hunger for God, remember he was down here in Ethiopia and he had to go there across the Red Sea and he had to go right up there to Palestine because somebody told him of the true God. It's quite a journey. No blacktop roads, nowhere to lodge at night. And he'd go right up there, and he was an Ethiopian, and so he's an intellectual because he got his Bible in Hebrew, I'm sure it wasn't translated in Ethiopian, but he treasured it, he'd given a stack of money for it, and he's nursing that scripture, but he was one of very, very few men, and possibly then he only had a very slight part of it. Do you know there was a time in the history of England when a man would give a whole field of hay for one page of the Bible? I was told recently of a country Behind the Iron Curtain, where even today when the Bible is smuggled over, they, 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 they tear out pages. Keep, this, this man has the first, uh, uh, the, the first page in John, and the other brother has the second page, and, and they swap it. They put it between papers and they nurse it. And, and when they do meet, in a clandestine fashion, secretly somewhere, the brother told us just recently of going into behind the Iron Curtain. And somebody said, well now, uh, when you go from here to Prague, you go down the main street to Wenceslas Square and then you turn left and you see a man with a, with a green tie and a little white handkerchief and you, you just nod and he'll turn and go away and, and you'll go to a certain place. Or you go in the marketplace and when you go in the market you'll see a lady with a, a red kind of turban on and a bit of white at the side and you'll, you'll, you'll buy some bananas or something and you'll say, uh, we're meeting at so and so. Uh, it, it's under a railway arch, three miles south, and there'll be about ten people there. She is what they call an informer. And before long she's going to be caught and put to death. But they have a waiting list of informers. They have a waiting list of people who are wanting to communicate where you can go hear the word of God. Say, how many people did you get driving up in their lush automobiles from their wall-to-wall -wall carpeted homes and all that? How many people do you get midweek with all their devotion to Jesus? Uh, with all our sacrifice? Oh, we don't think about... I thought with Brother Andrew that wrote the book there, God Smuggler. I've known him for years. He'd come into New York and ring up and say, Len, I want to talk. And he came up. He prayed a, 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 nearly a whole night with us once. When you hear the stories of what people are doing now behind the Iron Curtain to get the Word of God, we don't value it. You can get a Bible for a dollar now. Our kids don't bother to read it. No. What? Read the Bible when you can read the funnies? Oh, come on. Come on now. We don't value the Word of God. Maybe we'll have to lose it to value it. And here you and I, every one of us, as I say again, preacher, Spurgeon didn't have a bigger Bible than you or me. He just used it better. Finney didn't have a bigger Bible than I have, but boy, did he dig into that Word of God. Joseph Parker, one of the great giants of the English pulpit, those amazing men. Now, I'm not saying we've no great preachers, I guess we have, but, but pro rata we don't have the same type and we don't have as many as we used to have. 
where men gave themselves continually to prayer in the Word of God. Now, I'm underlining this again, preacher. It's not your business to visit the sick. It's not your business to bury the dead. It's not your business to wear yourself out on ten committees. If you're going to be scriptural, and after all, the Bible, Christianity will only work one way, and that's God's way. And your problem, brother, is to get down on your face and get the Word of God and rightly divide the Word of Truth and preach it, whether they hound you out or whatever they do, preach it. That's all God has asked you to do. Preach it with faithfulness. Preach it with anointing. So when I read Hebrews 11 and I go through the list and see by faith, by faith, the assurance in the heart of Moses' father and mother was we're going to contradict the law of the state and we're going to put this little child on one side and they managed to keep him covered till he was about three months old and I think his lungs got too much for the job and he started squealing out. They said he's going to be caught. Now we're going to have to do something. Now what does faith do? Faith reckons. Sure, you read the story. They made a little art, they plaited it, and they pitched it, lined it in with pitch, and they put a cover on it, and then they pushed it out in the reeds. Huh? Would you like to do that? Come on, would you like to reckon on God like that? Faith what? It reckons and it risks. It sure risks. After all, you push the little baby out there in the reeds. Well, how do you know the wind won't blow the cover off it and the little thing get took before the day's out? Die of sunstroke. Every time we saw anything on the river at home, if we didn't know what was there, we all got rocks and hit the thing till it burst open to see what was it. Supposing mischievous boys did that in those days and started beating the little cradler. Supposing a crocodile came up. Supposing there was a swell in the river and a, there, there were a hundred things could have happened to the judge. But faith reckons on God and then faith rests and then it rests. You see the irony of God? God is going to take this little mite here and one day he's going to rule a great nation. But oh, what a long, long way he has to go. And his daddy and mummy are very poor, so the Lord says, well, I'll let the king adopt him and give him the best education he can have in the world. And if you think he wasn't educated, well, you read the seventh chapter of Acts of the Apostles. He was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. I guess he knew astrology. I guess he could speak in other languages. He had great ability. He became a military general. Everybody bowed down to him. His breast was covered with ribbons. Slaves attended him. And one day the Lord said to him, son, you're going to have a change. Instead of slaves buying at your feet, you're going to join the slaves. Instead of riding round town in a gorgeous chariot with beautiful uh, horses and Nubian slaves waving ostrich feathers to keep you cool, that was the air conditioning they had then, you're going to hit the road. Have you ever tried to imagine what it would be like tramping with a million people on a dirty road? Do you ever go down a dirty road after somebody else's automobile? Some ladies were driving an automobile this morning. They came in there and I said to my brother, look at the dirt we're going to have to follow. And the folk behind us were turning, we were turning up dirt. Just for, can you imagine going down the road, a million people treading down the road. Can you imagine them trying to find water? Come on, this is realistic. These were the days they lived in. It wasn't a black top road. There wasn't a Howard Johnson's. You couldn't stop and get a 7 up or a Coke or something else that kills you. You, you just had to look for water. Millions of people kick it, <coughs> coughing and sneezing, <coughs> after you've been riding around in a chariot, after your bed was smoothed every night, every, living in super luxury, and the Lord says, get up. Oh, I thought when a brother mentioned the other day here, he said something about dying for the Lord, and we say, yeah, you know, there's no heroism. Nobody's going to come and blast me out of my bed and pin me to the wall and shoot me. There's nothing much heroic about the Christian life. I think there is if you tried it. I think, brother, if you maybe sold your golf clubs and did without those for the next year, you might feel you were being crucified. Or if you decided not to buy a new automobile and give the balance of money to a mission society. Or if you said, well, there's a window down the road there and I don't see why we should spend $75 a week on food and she only spends 25 let's cut our budget down 15 a week at least and give her the 15 for the next month. You, you might do something to make her realize you really had some compassion. What do you want the Lord to do? Wake you up in the morning, Gabriel pulling your ear and saying, the Lord just had me type this in heaven. These are your rules for the next... Do you want him to do that? He's already done it in the book. As I said to some kids not long ago, I, I, I spoke to these kids in a castle. And it was on an island. I watched them come up in the great power boats, sailboats, power boats, wealthy kids. Some of the great names of America. They just relaxed in a beautiful 
libraries, a magnificent library in this castle, and they lounged back there. Well, well, I'm afraid you don't have in Christianity what we really need in our day. I said, say it again, so I said it. Christianity doesn't give us enough. I said, listen, I want to tell you something. The reason you reject Christianity is not because it offers too little, it's because it demands too much. Jesus doesn't ma demand your dirty sins and your lousy living, he'll get rid of it. He demands you, your spirit, your soul, your body, your mind, your faculty, your will. And if you become his, you become a slave to him, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And you have no right to your own. No right to your own time, no right to your own money, no right to your own decisions. You've got to find out what God wants. Moses thought he could, he, he could get the nation out of bondage by killing them. Why, he'd have been killing them till now and wouldn't have done the job, wouldn't he? Leaning on the arm of flesh, killing them one at a time, one a day. <laughs> he wouldn't have gone through in it for millennium. Oh yes, in this area, it's the faith of his father and mother. I hope your kids have seen a faith in you that lives. I hope they've seen a demonstration of Christ that they say, well, I don't want what the neighbors have, but I do want what my daddy has and my mummy has. Because, you see, it's the influence of the father and the mother right here on Moses. And then there comes a day when he has to make a choice. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. And Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And she clothed and fed him and educated him and done everything for him. And then he steps right out, right out of line there. Choosing rather, ah, here we are now. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Oh, say, there's something in the story that the Lord never really told us. Somewhere he had a vision. Somewhere, he, how did he know Christ was down there? But he says, I'm going to settle for Christ. I can't see him. I don't understand, but I have assurance in my heart. And because of that, I'm going to make my choice with Christ. And he chose to suffer affliction and privation rather than enjoy the short season of popularity in the royal palace. And then you find him again, what does he do? He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. Mark that word all through the epistle. There used to be a song, Harry Lauder, some of you won't remember him, but when I was a little boy, Harry Lauder was a star singer, and he used to sing old Scottish songs. And the one that he liked the best and became most popular in his singing was, Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end. And that's what it says here. Keep enduring, keep enduring, keep enduring. You may not always enjoy it, but endure it for Christ's sake. Amen. And he made a choice. We're always making choices. Man is not only born to trouble as the, as the sparks fly up, but he's born to choices. And some of the choices look real good until you get behind them and they're not so good. And he chooses here to go the way of the slave. No longer riding in his chariot. No longer servants to wait on him. Nobody to wash his feet. He's going to get up with a disgruntled bunch of people that brought the heart of God, never mind brought the heart of Moses. Do you know why he did it? Because like other characters in this chapter you can read of, it says he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He believed that God is just and holy and righteous and somewhere he's going to balance the budget. He doesn't have to do it now. Amen. Look, God can make demands on you if you're his child and he doesn't even have to explain. He doesn't even have to offer you a great reward. God says do it and you do it out of filial love and devotion to him. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood and destroyed the firstborn. And the, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they, you see, all this is faith building up. Faith here has developed and is developing more and more and more. Now what strange ways God has. We would never think of doing things the way God does them, would we? He's going to make this man, and what does he do? Well, he pulls him again out of luxury and super luxury, and he lets him go on the backside of the desert. Could you imagine if we pulled somebody like General Patton or Mr. Eisenhower out of World War II and said, you're finished there, the government's given you a ranch of 6,000 acres, and you've got 10,000 sheep. You've got... I've got what? A military general with five stars on my shoulder, and you're going to let me look after sheep? 
Well, God has some nice ways of humbling us, doesn't he? Yeah. Go on the backs. I think he must have walked up and down that desert path, and when he got around 80, say, I'll be 80 tomorrow. Boy, I've just been... Hey, this is really something. Yeah. Isn't it? How long did he live? He lived 120 years. The first 40 years he went to the University of Egypt and he learned. The second 40 years he went to the University of Silence and learned a lot more. And when two-thirds of his life was gone, oh, the, now, Lord, you, you don't, now, you, you could have done this better. I mean, a man of 40 years of age has all the vigor and vitality. Why not use him from 40 to 80 and then let him retire and write his memoirs? Well, I'm glad the Lord didn't say to him, Moses, come here, I want to talk to you a little bit. Sit under this tree here. Look, Moses, you've left a lot. But do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you the author of five of the most amazing books in history, if you obey me. And another thing, for a bonus, I'm going to take you up on a mountain and I'm going to unveil myself to you for 40 days. And I've never done this to any living person. And Moses, and he starts... Offering, bribing him. No, no, he didn't. He covered it all up. He said, are you willing to go? Supposing you get nothing. Are you willing to be shut away for 40? 40 is the period of probation, isn't it? 40 years in the wilderness. 40 days after the resurrection. 40 days of fasting. It's a time of testing under divine probation with God looking on. You ever try to fast for 40 hours? Did you ever try and get away with God for 40 days? I remember a big giant of a fellow coming through a place where I was working and I could hear him coming down the corridor with some other men and I heard somebody <coughs> say, this next office is Len Ravenhill's. Oh, oh, I've read some of his books. Do you think he might be in? Well, let's try. I said, yeah, come in. Well, here was this... What I call a typical Texan, a fellow about six foot three with huge shoulders, very handsome fellow, had his wife with him, a South American lady, had this other man. He said, I wanted to see you. I said, well, sit down. He said, I bought a book of yours a few months ago and I was reading it and I came to that chapter, The Harness of Discipline. But he said, I'm a very undisciplined man. Uh, and when I read that chapter, he said, I, 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 I got a bit mad about it. Brother told me here last night before he left, he said, I, the first book of yours I got was Why Revival Tarries. And when I got into it, he said, every page I read, I got more mad and more mad and more mad. And he said, one day I got it and tossed it over my head and said, I'm not reading that thing. And it went way down back of my filing cabinets and I left it in the dust. But my spiritual life began to dry up something like this. And then he said... One day I thought, oh, maybe I should read Ray Newell's book. And he said, I went and dug it out. And he said, when I dug it out, the Lord began to work and it just changed my life. Amen. We don't like to talk about discipline. We think the Lord has loosed us from everything and we've no obligation much to anything or anybody. Just preach a few little sermons or teach my Sunday school class. This big fellow says, I've got no discipline. He said, I read your book and the Lord said to me, go hide in a cabin up there in Minnesota somewhere. Get up in the sticks. Cancel your meetings for a month. Come and get along with me and I'll talk to you. And he said, I let it slip. And he said, I came to town. And he said, I'm staying in the home of a certain man. You know him. And I said, sure, I know him. He's a very wonderful man. He's a Pentecostal brother. He has the finest restaurant in town. And he said, I'm his guest. And he said, do you know what happened when I walked in the house yesterday? Your book was sitting in the chair he offered me. He said, when he went out of the room, he said, I opened the book. And where did I open it? The harness of discipline. Oh, boy. That's the last thing I want to see. And he clenched his fist and he burst into tears with his wife there and the other fellow. He said, Rachel, I preach and I, I have a healing ministry. And I get great crowds. And I don't want to shut myself away. He said, you see, that book made me realize I'm not the man I thought I was. I love crowds more than... I, I can't give up preaching for a month. Me be silent for a month. Me get up. I said, why don't you? 
Because God will block the road up there. You may escape in this, he'll block the road there. And when you get up there, he'll block the road there until he gets you to the place of obedience. You're in trouble. God never lost a battle yet, so you better watch out. He never lost a battle with a man. He never lost a battle with a group of people or a nation. God always wins. You better watch out. Oh, the harness of discipline. Paul says, I'm not going to offer you big rewards. In his mind, he knew that God was just and holy. He would reward, but he didn't say, well, Lord, all right, if you make me the author of Genesis and Exodus and these marvelous books, which are going to be bestsellers, and you can pay me royalties when I get to heaven, and uh, you make me the leader, I'm going to establish my name, and I'm going to meet you one day in a bush, and I'm going to see your glory pass by, I'll settle for it. He didn't say that. He obeyed God. I wonder what passed off for all the 40 years. It was, maybe there's a lot there that's never been revealed. I've often wondered what Paul saw when he says he, he, he was taken up into heavenly places and the Lord said, you keep your mouth closed, you never tell anybody what I've shown you. That's hard going, isn't it? I mean, if you could only tell people what the Lord told you, boy, they'd think you were the greatest saint in the neighborhood or you'd more wisdom than any man they've ever heard of. And the Lord says, you, you keep your mouth shut. Huh? That's pretty hard going. You see, the d development in the life of Moses is getting stronger. He has 40 years of testing, and as I said last night or the other night, oh my, it must have got wearing some, you know, some years. He must have got tired sometimes. But remember afterwards, God takes him on a mountain and gives him one day with God for every one year that he spent there in loneliness and isolation. He's been faithful in that which is least, and God will make him faithful in that which is much. He's been faithful when there was nobody looking around, and now God says, well, come on, Moses, come on. Or you can bring Aaron and her up the hill, but then quit there. You know, there's only so far you can go with other people. I don't care who, who you listen to preaching. Jesus had twelve disciples, out of the twelve he had three, out of the three he had one, and then there's a place where he leaves him behind and he goes up. Moses goes up and the Lord says, now Moses, leave them fellows here and uh, you just come up higher and I'll wrap you in the cloud. So that he couldn't look down and see the crowd, so that they couldn't look up and see him. And the Lord says, I'm not only going to, oh boy, you're going to write books, but I'm going to give you the ten basic laws of civilization. You're going to carry them down. I think it's in that book of, um, uh, of Schaeffer's, uh, uh, the uh, Death in the City, I think it is, where he quotes one of the greatest of modern psychologists, who is a Jewish fellow. And he says, you shouldn't get alarmed that laws are being broken. Why, why should we get alarmed? They've always been broken. They were broken before Moses got to the bottom of the mountain. They'd already made a car for another god. And the different thing about the generation I live in is not that they're breaking laws, but we've totally repudiated them. That's the difference. Men have always broken God's laws, but not, not in the way we legislated this week. As I said the other night, the 50th state now has legislated, at least the bill passed the third reading, and it's going to be ratified, I guess, that, that in Hawaii they're going to legalize abortion. So it's, becoming, it's going to become the abortion mill for America. Everybody, the people that wanted are going to fly over there. And we're making it easier and easier and easier and easier as we can for sin. Side two. Broken and, and legally broken now. It's been established as a right of man. You can't hold any nation together. You can hold any nation together if you obey the Ten Commandments. You can hold no nation together. One great outstanding politician here. Returned from, America, returned from Russia not long ago and he said, the thing that angers me is this. There's no rioting amongst the students in Russia. And it's almost totally impossible in Russia to get a divorce. Whereas here you can get it almost on any basis. Oh my, how far we've gone. And we've gone that way primarily in my judgment because the church lacks faith. I'll say something about this again tonight, I guess. I've heard people say very often, I guess you have, I've heard people say, well, God has no favorites. Well, I think he has. He bestows favors on those who obey him continually. That's the favoritism you get. You know, and again, in that little old hymn, and the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. There's no other way. Now, again, because the parents of Moses did, as I've said, the three simple laws in this thing, 
first of all, they reckoned on God, then they rested, and they pushed that little craft into the bushes, and then they rested. And hey, lo and behold, who came down there but the princess? What should she have done? By every law that her father had made, she should have said, drown the baby, it's a Hebrew child, or throw it to the crocodiles, or put a sword through it. But the Lord turned her heart, and she takes the child and nurses it, takes care of it, educates it, the child, strangely enough, is accepted into the... In, in, it's, it's ironical. Makes you laugh. The king had said, I'll destroy every child, uh, and now the child he loves the most is a Hebrew child. Isn't it amazing how God can give favor in adverse circumstances? He works everything after the power of his own will, after the counsel of his own will. He made that entry. No other entry could have been made, but because they had simple faith, and then once the boy had gone, I guess they relaxed, and faith rested and said, you just watch our Moses. You see Moses go down the street in a chariot today? Everybody bows, and he, this is the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Yes, but the task came to them too, because, uh, as, as I say, he had to go back onto the back side of the desert. Boy, it's a great place. I'll tell you, in case you don't know, there's lots of room there. They're still waiting for some more students if you want to go. You could pack up and go somewhere down in Arizona or somewhere down here where it's warm, maybe one person or maybe two together, and say, look, let's go and find God's will. Let's get together for the next week or next two weeks or next 40 days and drive off somewhere where we're not accessible and just take the word of God and get down and find his will for this circumstance that we're in right now. Because the word of God says that he that doeth the will of God, he abideth forever. Now again, it all comes back to whatsoever he saith unto you. Do it. It's always so easy to do what the other fellow's doing, isn't it? Eh? Oh, if I had a church like that, boy, I'd never look back, but look at my bunch. And that fellow's breaking his heart, only he hasn't mentioned it as much as you have. Huh? Eh? Maybe you turn, learn, learn to take it to the Lord in prayer, and uh, uh, one day you'll discover how often his pillow is wet with tears, or how many other tight situations he had, but he believed God. We may trust him fully. All for us to do, they that trust him wholly, find him wholly true. There's one word here as we finish that occurs more in this epistle, I think, than any other epistle in the, uh, any other part of the word of God. In verse 13 of 11 it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises. And the promises are mentioned twice as many times in the epistle to the Hebrews as any other book in the New Testament. Promises, promises. I once preached for a week with Van Tavner, found him very interesting, very witty fellow too. Now remember, he said on one day, we, we, he said, we come to church, he said, and we think, standing on the promises. He said, we don't have many people standing on the promises, they're all sitting on the premises. These promises. Say, when did you last grasp in despair, hold of a promise with two hands, and hold it up to the devil of the world, and say, Lord, I believe you, I believe you, I believe you, you've made a promise. It's God's promise, not Gabriel's. Now, the headquarters, it's God's promise. Well, then, if I'm living in obedience, surely I have a right to take that promise and, and take hold of it, I say, by both hands and believe God. And find out He is a rewarder. Not of those who seek Him. That is what the text says. Those who diligently seek Him. The woman lost a piece of silver and she thought, no, 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 she didn't seek for it. She sought diligently for it. But what did she do before she sought it? She put the candle there. No good scraping around in the darkness, the dirt on the floor. She lit the candle. What's the candle? The Word of God. Like the Word of God, hair are exceeding great and precious promises. And then suddenly the thing becomes illuminated. In the darkness. You start diligently and you seek until you find it. Now when you find it, you run with joy and say, hey, come on, God has done the thing that I... I've been expecting to do for so long. She found the piece that was lost. My, there's a lot of things we've got to find back these days in which we live. Hmm? We've turned so many of our preachers out almost like turning a handle in our seminaries and our Bible schools and they're all stamped very much alike. And here and there a guy dares to be different and break off and say, look, I'm going to fast and pray and seek God and 
I'm going to get all of these promises. I believe that God is, and he's a rewarder, and I really mean business with him. Amen. Some of the best little books that are out these days are in the Moody series, and there's one of them by a, a little book on a fellow called John Fung. Anybody ever read John Fung's life? Only one. Well, you should read that. It costs you 49 cents to get electrified. John Fung's daddy was a missionary in China before the collapse of China. Johnson came to this country, he could, it's F-U-N-G, it's pronounced Soong, I guess. And John came to this country with the idea that he was going to be a, he's going to be a scientist, I think. And when he got to this country, he was here three and one half years. In that three and a half years, he learned English, so he could speak it eloquently. He learned German and did a study in German for his PhD, and his German professor said, how many years have you known German? He said, I didn't know a word of it six months ago. I don't believe you. Well, he said, it's true. He learned English, he learned German. He got his BA, his MA, and his PhD, and learned two languages in three and a half years, which isn't bad going. He was written up in Time magazine, Life magazine, as the most brilliant foreign student that ever came to America. And just before he finished, he met a fellow one day who said to him, John, you look like a preacher. Now, I don't know how you have to look like a preacher. Maybe more dumb than anyone else, but I, I don't know, you know. Somebody says that's what D.D. means, decidedly dumb, but I don't know. But anyhow, you look more like a preacher than you look like a, a, a scientist. And he said, well, my daddy is a Methodist preacher in China. And I really came, I, 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 I was thinking, maybe I'd go into the ministry. So this fellow said, well, look, for your daddy's sake, why don't you go to the theological seminary in New York and take your last six months there before you leave for China? At that time, the president of that college was Sloan Coffin. What's well, a good name for a dead seminary, but anyhow. Sloan Coffin and the great high priest of modernism was Harry Fosby. And what that little Chinaman believed when he went in that college, he did not believe when he'd been there three months. And one night he talked to himself and he said, Well, John Fung, what have you got in coming to America anyhow? PhD? Oh, you've got a bunch of diplomas, you've got a bunch of golden keys, you've got diplomas for all over the world, but you don't have a bit of faith in God. You're a bigger heathen now than when you came. And he said, suddenly, just like that, he knelt at the side of the bed and he didn't know why he should say it in one sense. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, I am a sinner. And as quick as that, the burden loose, and he got up and he opened the door and he ran through that seminary, leaping and pointing God like a man in the third chapter of Acts, shouting hallelujah. And the boys opened the door and stood in the pajamas and said, the Chinaman's gone crazy. He's gone mad. It was a gossip around the breakfast table in the morning. The president sent for him. Do you know what they did, those kind Christian gentlemen? They had him certified as insane. And they sent him to the insane institution in White Plains, New York. When he got there, he did what I'd do. He got out, ran away. And the cops sent a message around New York. A man, a Chinaman, is a, he's dangerous, he's mad, he's hiding somewhere. If I remember right, they found him hiding in some bushes in Central Park and they took him back. And he said, Lord, I didn't come from China to be amongst these guys. This fellow says he's Julius Caesar, and this fellow says you're a liar. He's not Julius Caesar. He's Napoleon. I'm Julius Caesar. And, and they were climbing up the walls and swinging on the lamps. And he says, Lord, I didn't come. I, I, I've got a PhD. I'm a doctor. I didn't come to America to spend my days in an institution like this. Now, Lord, what will he do? And he said, the Lord said, <clears throat> Well, I'll get you out of here. That's no problem. But I'll tell you. If you'll stay here, I forget the exact number, I think it's 193 days, if you'll stay in this institution amongst these madmen, so if you want to go to a good university, I can get you in. Uh, <clears throat> if you'll go with these madmen for 193 days, I'll reveal myself to you, and I'll reveal... He said, fine, it's a deal. In 193 days, I don't know how he did it, he read this book through, or maybe it was the New Testament, 40 times. He learned eight different ways to analyze a chapter without anybody instructing him. When he got ready to the end of the time, he was praying and the Lord said, John, you're going to go back to China and you're going to live 
15 years, just 15 years. When they released him, you know, when Mr. Khrushchev came to this country, they rolled the red carpet out and gave him an escort. Because he was only a communist. But this man is a sweet Christian, and so they put a cop on either side of him and watched him every inch to the boat, and then put him on the boat in either Frisco or LA, and were very glad they got rid of the plague. And the government paid for the men to come back. As he got into China Sea, the Lord said, John, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to do the will of God. I'm going to preach. What are you depending on? I'm depending on the Holy Spirit. What about that bag of diplomas and that case of golden keys and all those diplomas and things? Sure you're not leaning? No, 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 he said I. And then what he did, he joined the Baptist. <coughs> he baptized them all. He put them in the bag and dropped them overboard. <laughs> With the exception of his PhD, which the Lord said, you show your daddy that because he invested in you and he trusted you. But the golden keys and everything, and he watched the bubbles go, and he said, that's the end of any confidence in the flag. He got home. When he got home, his neighbor came in. Oh, I see Johnny's back from America. Oh, he looks so nice in the way he's dressed. And you remember, Mr. whatever his name was, you promised that if I got a daughter and you had a son, we'd get them married. This is a custom. You've no choice in it, so I'm bringing my daughter over to marry your son. Oh, John could have said, but I'm a Christian. I need to pray two days to find the will of God. He just accepted it. The Lord said, it's all right. He married the girl he'd never seen. He led her to Christ, and he said, darling, I'm going to live 15 years. That's all. Well, some of you read stories, you know, about Andrew Gee and the rest of the boys there, and you know what the fellows do out there? Once they get really going, they buy European clothes and nice ties and immaculate dress. John Singh had baggy trousers, a 50-cent shirt he tied on the corner, a, 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 a lock of hair that wouldn't stay back, a little prodigal thing there he had trouble with. And he kissed his wife goodbye after a few weeks, and he went way, way up in the wilds of Mongolia. He went into areas where even Jonathan Goforth couldn't get revival. He went in areas where Andrew Gee could not get revival. And I was saying this one day in a meeting, and a lady... Uh, Pardon me, a big fat lady that had been playing the organ. They were sitting there and the tears rolling down her face. And she said, oh, thank you for talking about John Singh. And I said, did you read the book? I never read the book. I used to work with him in China. So oh, I said, how wonderful. Tell me this. This book seems so exaggerated. She said, you couldn't exaggerate his life. He was far holier than anything. She said, you know, he used to come to the home of a lady that I knew. And you know, it's true, he lived 15 years, and for about the last year of his life, he was so racked with tuberculosis. When he came home, there'd be a baby born in the home, and the kiddies wouldn't know him. Didn't know that daddy, he'd been away so long. And this woman said when he had finished preaching at night, he would have to get on his knees and hold his stomach with one hand, because he was so racked with pain, and he would just say, come to Jesus now, will you? And he'd get home, get up and go home. And she said he'd lay across the bed. And his body would be heaving like a dog that had been chased and his little cotton shirt sticking to the sweat on his back. Now, I've never heard anybody quote this scripture outside of its true context. I guess you haven't. But she said every time I looked at his panting, heaving body and I knew he was going every beat nearer to death, but the 15 years, it only a year to go. And she said every time I saw that thin, wasted frame, beating there, I could only think of one text. This is my body, which is broken for you. And he said he literally broke his health and strength for 15 years. I have heard people say now that they have come through from Oslo and they've had news from China. And where the Church of Jesus Christ is strongest, it's stronger in those areas where John Sung taught, it's stronger there than even where Watchman Nee was teaching, and stronger even than where Goforth had revival. And all he did, when he stepped off the boat, when he'd thrown away all his confidence in the flesh, he said, the only thing I did was get hold of God's word and say, God is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But I don't believe God put this book here to mock me. He put it there to challenge my faith. Not a faith I have in articles that I signed to join the church. An active, living, vital faith. And when we return to this, when we cast off all confidence in the flesh, in organization, everything else that props us up these days, 
And say, Lord, look, I'm going to start a new career spiritually. I'm putting my finger on Hebrews 11:16, And then I'm going to the fourth chapter there in Romans. And let me give you the verse and quit. Romans 4 and what? Um, 21, being fully persuaded that what he promised, let's put it in the text, being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he is able to perform for me in the day in which I live. And I'll go out on a limb right here and say there are enough of us here to see a spiritual revolution formed in America if we really believe God to this degree. I talk tonight about stopping the powers of darkness. But friends, I want to tell you, this book is as valid as the very moment the ink was put down to write it. The resources behind it, there's no weakness, there's no decay, there's no failure, there's no unwillingness. All you and I have to do is get to the place of total bankruptcy. I have no confidence in the flesh. And say again and really mean it, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling.